I've spent dozens and dozens of hours over the past few months researching this band and a lifetime listening to their music and I still feel like I've barely scratched the surface of who they are. There are so many layers and intricacies and subtleties to this band so I'm really excited to bring you the story of the Velvet Underground. It's been a lot of research to get here so let me know what you think. little caveat before we get started, this is the story of the Velvet Underground. So while Nico and John and Lou all had really important and long careers after the band, I'm not really going to talk about them all that much. All of those careers deserve to be talked about and they are really interesting and important in their own way, but this is the story of the Velvet Underground. I'll very briefly summarize the rest of their careers, but believe me, this video is going to be long enough as it is, and I want to make sure the bulk of it is about the Velvet Underground as a band. Figured I'd just get that out of the way at the top before my comments are full of people telling me all the stuff I didn't talk about post Velvets. When you're growing up in a small town, when you're growing up in a small town. Lewis when Reed was born in 1942 in, in New York City. His grandparents were Russian Jews who came to America to flee anti Semitism, and they lived in the area that would become Northeast. East Poland eventually, but they wound up in New York. Lou's father, Sidney Rabinowitz, was born in 1913. He had three half-siblings born to Lou's grandfather, Mendel, in the old country, and two brothers from Mendel's new wife in America. When Sidney was growing up, he dreamed of being a doctor or a lawyer, but his parents pushed him to something more practical, so he became an accountant. Then he met Toby Futerman, who was also born to Jewish immigrants. Toby's father died when she was just 16, so in order to help make ends meet for her family, she went to work at a firm that supplied lawyer support staff. It was at that office that a beauty pageant scout saw her, and she was soon crowned queen of the stenographers of New York City. Two years later, Toby was a stay-at-home mom, raising her new son, Louis, in an apartment in Sheepshead Bay. According to an old family story, Sydney was once questioned by the FBI about an organization that they were investigating that Sidney had done some accounting work for, and that really spooked him, so he changed their last name from Rabinowitz to Reed in order to mitigate some of that anti-Semitism that people would automatically pour on them once they heard that last name. Lou quickly became really interested in music, falling in love with the rock and roll radio stations. He said, quote, Movies didn't do it for me. TV didn't do it for me. It was radio that did. He loved doo-wop and the, like, four-chord pop songs. He took both piano and guitar lessons, but he claims he quit them early on when the teachers wouldn't let him play what he wanted to play. He was something of a troubled child, probably dealing with a lot of anxiety, maybe brought on by his issues with his own sexuality and trying to understand that fluidity of it. His sister said that he had a fragile temperament. A childhood friend of his said that this was the time that Lou started writing in his journals about queerness and homosexuality, probably trying to just get a better understanding of the feelings that he was having that weren't openly talked about in the culture at that time. As a junior in high school, he met a guy named Phil Harris, who was a senior, but who was also super interested in rock and roll. They decided to create a Little Richard act for the school variety show, and there was a guy in the audience named Elliot Gottfried who saw them and was actually really impressed and thought maybe they could do something with this act. So he introduced them to a guy named Bob Shad, who had worked for Mercury Records before leaving and starting his own tiny imprint called Time Records. Side note, if you've watched some of my older videos, Bob Shad might sound familiar. He was the first guy to sign Big Brother and the Holding Company, and he pretty royally screwed them over. He's also the grandfather of Judd Apatow, so watch the Janis Joplin video if you kind of want more of that story. So in 1958, at just 16 years old, Lou Reed went into the studio for the first time. The band changed their name from The Shades to The Jades and soon had their very own record. The record made it into a few local jukeboxes and was played on the radio at least once, but it was far from a runaway hit. But Lou didn't really care. He learned a lot through that experience. More importantly, he had a band that had a record and played in a few spots around the neighborhood and people in his high school started looking at him as this bona fide rock star and that kind of meant more to Lou than 
having a successful record at that point. When Phil graduated, he joined the Navy, which ended the Jades, but Lou quickly started forming other bands. He really loved this image of being a rock star, even if no one outside of his school knew who he was. After graduation, Lou attended NYU for, I think, like half of a semester before he dropped out due to emotional reasons. His sister said, quote, My mother came into my room and told me that they thought he might have schizophrenia. The doctors told her it was because she had not picked him up enough as an infant. It was a belief and burden she took to her grave, end quote. So in early 1960, living back home with his parents, they sought out some sort of mental health treatment for him. Unfortunately, a popular form of mental health treatment at that time was electroshock therapy. One book suggested that Lou started these treatments even before he went to college as early as 17, but either way, going through that treatment deeply impacted him and would be an experience that would haunt him for the rest of his life. As he tended to do as he got older, he was able to turn it into part of his mythology, but it was still a scar that always pained him. Lou claimed later that the electroshock therapy was, at least in part, in an attempt to cure him of his homosexuality. He said, quote, They put the thing down your throat so you don't swallow your tongue, and they put electrodes in your head. That's what was recommended to discourage homosexual feelings. End quote. In September of 1960, he enrolled at Syracuse University as a freshman because he never finished his first year at NYU, and that was where he really started to find his creative legs and kind of experiment more with what he wanted to do. He met another guitarist named Sterling Morrison. Born in 1942 in Long Island, Sterling's parents divorced when he was quite young. Sterling met Mo Tucker, someone who we'll talk about much later, when he was a kid because she was the sister of one of his school friends. Sterling was learning how to play the trumpet when his teacher was drafted, so he switched to guitar. He was really inspired by a lot of the early rockers that inspired almost everyone else, like Chuck Berry and Bo Diddley. It was hard for me to find much about Sterling's early years, but he did say that he had a lot of bands in high school, they just never really went anywhere. He never made a record like Lou did. Sterling said about his time in school, quote, I graduated high school with very high numbers and matching low esteem for just about everything but music, end quote. After high school, he attended the University of Illinois, but was asked to leave after two semesters for not participating in the mandatory ROTC program. Ditching ROTC was something him and Lou had in common. So Sterling wound up at Syracuse studying English, and him and his roommate, Bob Davidson, had a really great collection of blues records. Sterling and Bob were playing some of those records probably pretty loudly one night when Lou, who lived above them, heard it and came down to investigate. Lou had a campus radio show, and he was looking for some more blues records to really expand band what he was able to play on that show. Lou and Sterling hit it off immediately, having some of the same tastes and interests and background, both growing up in Long Island, but it would be a few years before they would more significantly partner up. Sterling and Bob did lend Lou a few records, but he was kicked off of the radio show before he ever got the chance to play them. When they met in 1962, Lou told Sterling that he wrote poetry, but he didn't say anything about music. In college, and at least a few years after, Lou was really focused on becoming a writer. That was his main goal. Sterling found out that Lou played guitar when Sterling was out doing his ROTC marches or whatever they did, and he heard Lou playing probably way louder than he really needed to in his dorm room. Syracuse was where Lou Reed started to branch out and do things differently. He met a writer slash teacher named Delmore Schwartz, who really pushed Lou to try writing and try experimenting and would become another massive factor in the Lou Reed mythology. He also had a long-term girlfriend who would become quite a bit of a muse for him in his career, but he also had affairs and experimented with men. He started a band called L.A. and the Eldorados, and he landed a manager who had a few local connections, but was definitely not like a big industry guy. Syracuse was also where he tried heroin for the first time and contracted hepatitis from sharing a needle. He remembers this as the period where he started writing the song called Heroin. He said, quote, At the time I wrote Heroin, I felt like a very rather negative, strung out, violent, aggressive person. I meant it to sort of exercise the darkness or the self-destructive element in me, end quote. But it was when he got out of college that he got his shot at finally being a full-time creative, even in kind of a different way than he expected. I want the benefit of a timeless muse. I want to eradicate my negative views. A budget record label based out of Long Island City called Pickwick International hired him as a songwriter. Pickwick was something of an interesting endeavor. They specialize in reissues and kind of like one-off collections of knockoff songs kind of mimicking popular styles of the day. Stuff like The Sound of Summer or The Sound of Teenagers, things like that with like no-name artists. Pickwick hired young songwriters who were really passionate 
and worked really hard, but were not very expensive. So Lou would go into the office, hear what kind of songs Pickwick wanted, and then he would go into a room with the other writers and just churn out a bunch in that style. He said, quote, they would say, write 10 California songs, 10 Detroit songs. Then we'd go down to the studio for an hour or two and cut three or four albums really quickly. It didn't matter who wrote the song. Four people got credit for it, end quote. Lou kind of really loved working there, even if it wasn't the super artistic and meaningful work that he would become famous for. It was still a step into the music industry and into professional writing. And even if there's no way to know exactly what Pickwick songs he wrote and performed on, you can generally hear his influence in some of the recordings. And it was through those knockoff songs at Pickwick that Lou Reed met John Cale. Lou wrote kind of like a silly novelty song called The Ostrich that started to get a little bit of traction. Pickwick released it under the name The Primitives, and then once it got popular, people started calling Pickwick and asking for The Primitives to come perform the song. So Pickwick decided to put a band together and see if they could ride the ostrich for a little bit longer. A Pickwick producer named Terry Phillips approached a 22-year-old Welshman named John Cale and asked him to be in the band. Apparently, Terry thought that John played pop music because John had long hair. John Cale was born in 1942 in a mining village in Wales and spent most of his early life desperately trying to get out of that tiny mining village. Like most people in the town, John's father named William was a miner and his mother Margaret was a school teacher. When they got married, they moved in with Margaret's parents. John had a pretty strained relationship with his father. He said that his grandmother refused to let English be spoken in the house, so John only knew Welsh, but his father only knew English, so they'd didn't communicate at all. He said, quote, So it was very quiet, and my communication with my father was limited because I didn't speak English and he didn't speak any Welsh. But there's this overwhelming feeling that you are inadequate. End quote. When he was seven, John finally learned English in grammar school and was actually able to communicate with his dad, but I highly doubt those conversations were long and meaningful and full of love. Especially since John's dad worked overnight in the mines, so John rarely saw him anyway. Also around the age of seven, John's mom put him in piano lessons because she played piano and she was hoping John would really like it. It turns out he did. John said, quote, I realized that playing music gave me a stronger sense of who I was, end quote. As a child, he spent a bit of time being very ill with bronchitis, so he was given an opiate-based medicine to help with that. He said he remembered laying in bed and looking at the flowered wallpaper and watching it move, and it was a really early introduction to kind of like altered mind states and the creativity and the imagination that altered mind states could spark. The town was dominated by the mine and the health issues that it caused. John said that even inside of his house, he could hear the miners walking up the street by the way their lungs rasped when they breathed. So from a very early age, John knew that he did not want to spend his life down in the mines, which is just kind of what happened in that village. Your dad worked in the mines, his dad worked in the mines. When you grew up, you were going to work in the mines. Instead, John really devoted himself to music, and he practiced endlessly to get as good as he could at it. He saw it as an escape out of the town and out of the mines. His friends remembered that he would only come and play with them for like an hour or two before his mom would come bring him back to keep practicing. He started playing the organ in his local church, and that's where he became really interested in more liturgical compositional music. And he revealed in his autobiography that when he was a child, he was molested two times by an Anglican priest and by a music teacher, which undoubtedly had a massive impact on him. His grammar school had a lot of different instruments to choose from, so that's how John discovered the viola. It was actually the only instrument left when John went to audition for the school orchestra, so he just kind of picked it up. John said, quote, The viola is the saddest of all instruments. No matter how fast you play or how good you are, you can't really get away from the character of melancholy in it. But by becoming really good at it, he started to discover a pathway out of mining. But before he could make any of that a reality, he was hospitalized at the age of 16 after he suffered a nervous breakdown because his mother was diagnosed with breast cancer and his grandmother told him that it was his fault. But then he started to get opportunities with his music. He joined the National Youth Orchestra of Wales and he won a scholarship to study music at Goldsmiths College in London. He said, quote, I didn't get the grades enough to go into university, so I just got the best I could. I really persuaded the deputy warden in an interview that Goldsmiths was the right thing for me. I really wanted to be a composer and they gave me the opportunity. In London, he discovered a lot of radio stations from around the world and became super interested in what was happening in New York City. He said he was far more interested in what was happening across the world than he was 
and what was happening in his own city. He said that when he went to sleep in London, he knew that something really fascinating was happening in New York City, and he was missing it. John did a lot more fascinating stuff in England and had a lot more important roots there, but this video is already going to be long enough, so I'm going to kind of like skip forward a little bit. At university, John started a correspondence with John Cage, who was an experimental American composer, to put it very briefly. And then in 1963, he won a summer scholarship to a pretty prestigious classical musical academy in Massachusetts. When that ended, he exchanged his return ticket for enough money to rent a crappy apartment in New York City and never looked back. Soon, he started working pretty closely with John Cage, and through that relationship with John Cage, he met another experimental musician named Lamont Young, who would have a deep, profound impact on John Cale. Pretty soon after meeting him, maybe because, like, here's this young Welsh kid who was super in love with his work, Young added John Cale to his group called the Theater of Eternal Music. The idea behind that group was to explore sustained droning sounds. John said, quote, we created a kind of music that nobody else in the world was making and that nobody had ever heard before. It also featured a drummer named Angus McLeese. The group practiced for hours every single day, and through it, John learned a ton about the boundaries of music and exploring and experimenting what sound could do. Because of his association with Lamont Young and the Theater of Eternal Music, John became super ingrained in the underground art scene that was happening in Manhattan. He met a ton of multidimensional artists who were experimenting and pushing boundaries and, and just opening up new possibilities of what art could be across a variety of different mediums. Young also introduced John to weed and eventually more serious drugs. Young was something of a distributor for that underground art scene, and John would help him to earn a little bit of extra money. When Terry Phillips saw John Cale at a party and invited him into the Primitives, John thought it was absurd, but he was like, I could get some extra money for playing a few gigs, so might as well. So he joined the Primitives, and him and Lou Reed hit it off immediately. Lou was really excited about these like drone sounds. John said what he was doing at that time kind of sounded like a jet engine in his apartment. They eventually became roommates and grew so close that several people assumed they were a couple. Lou even taught John how to inject drugs. John said, quote, I was squeamish about needles. Lou took care of that by shooting me up for the first time. It was an intimate experience, not least because my first reaction was to vomit. End quote. Reed still primarily considered himself a writer, even submitting his poetry to various magazines who all rejected him, but John really loved the stuff he was writing. It was darker and more realistic than a lot of the pop songs that existed out there. So Lou and John started playing music together and busking on the street. They even recorded a demo together that was pretty like folky and singer songwritery. While Lou and John were experimenting with this new sound, Lou bumped into his old Syracuse friend Sterling Morrison at a train stop. Sterling at the time was finishing up his BA at City College. He said, quote, Lou invited me over to this guy Rick's place to get high and play music. The three of us kept going from that moment. End quote. Even at this early stage, with just the three of them, there was already some tensions within the group. John kind of saw himself as this, like, Phil Spector figure who would come in and compose all the music and set the sound for the band. But Lou already had an idea of what the songs he wrote should sound like, and he wasn't open to changing that. They brought in John's old bandmate Angus to play drums, and they called themselves the Falling Spikes. Angus was born in Connecticut, and even though he had some formal training, his style was so erratic that most people just assumed he taught himself how to play drums. Angus already had a long pedigree in the experimental art scene. He even founded a publishing house with his high school friend in Paris that published a lot of, like, beat poetry. With his drumming, he didn't like structure and just kind of let the flow of the music take him, which was kind of perfect for the Falling Spikes. But Angus was not reliable. He would show up to rehearsals and gigs whenever he wanted. He even just left and spent some time in England for a bit. And then he just up and quit the band when they had the audacity to accept some money for a gig. They booked a gig at a New Jersey high school for $75, and Angus thought they had sold out. Apparently, he said, quote, You mean we start when they tell us to and have to end when they tell us to? I can't work that way. End quote. So the guys turned to Mo Tucker, the sister of Sterling's school friend. 
Maureen Tucker was born in New York City in 1944. She became inspired to start drumming when she heard the Rolling Stones, but she developed a completely unique style. She didn't understand the need for cymbals, so she never used hi-hats or crash cymbals or anything like that. She said that growing up, she didn't want to just listen to the records she bought, she wanted to play along. She said, quote, And since I didn't know how to play guitar or anything, I bought a snare drum, and I would just sit in my room and play along to their album until it was white. End quote. Since she didn't use cymbals, she sometimes used mallets instead of sticks. She just had this like completely unique style. She even played standing up, and Lou loved her immediately. She was working as a key punch operator when Lou came over to her house to hear her play and to see if she could keep a beat. She says she doesn't remember what she played for Lou on that day, but whatever it was, it was good enough and she was in the band. Initially, John didn't want her in the band, but he said, quote, She turned out to be incredible. No cymbals, brilliant. She was perfect because she understood the value of simplicity, end quote. So now with a new drummer, they also found a new name. Sterling thinks that it was Angus who originally picked the book up off a discount rack, but however they found it, they took their name from kind of like a strange pop sociology book written by Michael Lay. It was about the sexual corruption of the 60s, at least as Michael saw it, and he called it the Velvet Underground. So in December of 1965, they played their first gig at a high school in New Jersey with Mo Tucker on drums, under the name The Velvet Underground. A few days later, they started playing a residency at a little tourist trap in Greenwich Village called Cafe Bazaar. The Love and Spoonful had previously done a residency there, so their manager thought it could be a pretty good springboard for the group, and he wasn't wrong, because that's where Barbara Rubin saw them for the first time. Barbara was an avant-garde filmmaker who was also really good at setting up connections within the experimental art world, just kind of knowing who would get along and knowing who could help each other with their art. She knew that the legendary artist Andy Warhol was really interested in exploring music and how he could incorporate that into what he was doing, so she brought Andy to see them play at Cafe Bazaar, and Andy fell in love. Normally, this is where I would take some time to talk about Andy's background, but I mean, he's Andy Warhol. I can't say anything that hasn't already been said about him, so what you need to know for this story is that Andy kind of ran a collection of artists known as The Factory. The Factory was his workshop in Manhattan where he would invite a whole bunch of experimental and avant-garde artists to work and live and party and hang out. The Factory became a scene in itself. You kind of had to be invited in, but once you were, you were a part of this beautiful, crazy, interesting, insane art community. It was kind of like the avant-garde art community that John Cale had fallen into with Lamont Young and John Cage, but like much more famous. The factory people were the it crowd of Manhattan in the 60s, and it looked like the Velvet Underground were poised to step into that. Warhol wanted to create a show around the Velvet Underground that he called the Exploding Plastic Inevitable. The show was a multi-dimensional art experience. The band would play their songs while Andy Warhol projected films on top of them with strobe lights and an artist dancing with a whip in front of them. It was loosely controlled mayhem. The Exploding Plastic Inevitable played their first show for a meeting of New York City psychologists. And at that show, Barbara Rubin wandered around the crowd saying really sexually aggressive and explicit things to the psychologists and when they got offended Barbara kind of act shocked and said I thought you could take it since you're a psychologist. The Exploding Plastic Inevitable played quite a few happenings around New York City and then they took the show on the road and played an 18-night residency on the Sunset Strip in California. But the group always butted up against the California scene, which was kind of developing in tandem to the New York underground scene. At least Lou did, but I mean, he butted up against everybody. Lou famously hated the Grateful Dead and their whole community. He thought they were untalented. So they were just kind of plugging along with the exploding plastic inevitable, and then Andy decided to change things up a bit. According to Lou, Andy presented them with Nico as an ultimatum. If they let Nico into the band, Andy would be their manager with all of the benefits that that entailed, including giving them a rehearsal space, sponsoring them to buy equipment, getting them connections within the industry. Also, just the name recognition of being Andy Warhol's band is something that a lot of new bands would dream of. But if they didn't let Nico into the band, 
than no Andy. Presented with that, as much as they grumbled, it really wasn't much of a choice. Andy apparently thought Lou wasn't very good as a frontman and thought that they wouldn't really get anywhere if he was the primary focal point of the group. And for his part, Lou thought that they could just kind of like use Nico sparingly and not make her an actual member of the band. All right, side note before we get into this, I see the comments. I know that people don't love when I mispronounce things. So if me mispronouncing something minor in these videos is enough for you to just hate the whole thing, then this probably isn't the channel for you. I'm going to always mispronounce things. I'm sorry, it's just kind of what happens. I'm bad at pronunciation. But I also feel like I could make an effort to do better at that. So with that in mind, I looked up how to say this name and I watched several videos and they all said something different. Some people said Krista Pafkin, some said Pofkin, some said Fagin. So I don't know, if you're German, you might have a better idea than the rest of us, so please let me know in the comments. And if you think you know how it's pronounced, the chances are someone out there also thinks they know how it's pronounced and disagrees with you. So I'm sorry, I'll probably mostly call her Nico. But Nico was born at Krista Pafkin, Pafkin, Fagin in Germany in 1938. Her father died in the war, so she spent most of World War II moving around with her mother. As a teenager, she purposely put herself in high-end shopping centers, hoping she would be noticed by like a talent scout. Eventually she was, and she started a modeling career, appearing in magazines all over Europe, and even got small roles in a few movies including one called La Dolce Vita, which Lou saw when he was at Syracuse. Similar to Lou Reed and Andy Warhol, Nico had a habit of inventing stories about her past, and she encouraged other people to add on to and expand those stories, to the point that it becomes really hard to make sense of what actually happened in her life. For example, she claims that she was sexually abused by an African-American soldier in Germany, but there's no records of that incident or the subsequent trial or anything like that, so people are kind of hesitant to accept that story. Once her modeling career took off, she moved to Paris and fell really in love with music. A nightclub owner she was dating named Nico Papatakis encouraged her to take singing lessons and really give it a go at music. So she stole his name as her stage name. I saw somewhere else say that a German photographer named Hubert Tobias was the one who encouraged her to change her name. So whatever the cause, she's now going by Nico. Also, when she was pretty young, she had a son and people speculate that it was the result of an affair with a very popular French actor, but he has always denied it. She then moved to London and saw Bob Dylan play and was really inspired by that, and then she allegedly had something of a fling with Bob Dylan. She also was dating Brian Jones from the Rolling Stones at this time, and she was hanging out with Ernest Hemingway in Paris. She just... Nico had a way of just being where things were happening and getting involved in it. I guess that's a skill in its own right, and I don't really know how she managed to do that, I guess just by being a beautiful young model, you just kind of have those opportunities, I guess. While she was in London, she did a few recordings, but none of them really went anywhere. And then she met Andy Warhol and other members of the factory when they were in Paris doing this kind of like art blitz of Europe. So when she went to New York in the fall of 1965, she sought out Andy Warhol and she gave him a copy of her record that she made. Then Andy thought it would be a really good idea to put this beautiful blonde woman at the front of this band that he had just started working with called the Velvet Underground. On January 3rd, 1966, Nico met the Velvet Underground and they had their first rehearsal at the factory. John said, quote, I was just getting over the fact that we had Mo in the band. Did we really need another woman? Then it struck me that this was great PR on Andy's part. She had this blonde bombshell look. People couldn't take their eyes off her, end quote. Almost right away, there was even more tension in the band. Lou and Nico started a little bit of an affair, which added some sexual tension. Lou was still wary of John's creative ideas. John was still frustrated that Lou wouldn't give him any kind of creative input. Sterling and Moe were very passive aggressive, which kind of fueled that fire a little bit. Nico invented this idea that there was a power struggle between her and Lou, even though the rest of the band didn't really like Nico either, but they kept on playing with the exploding plastic inevitable, and even taking the show on the road for a few tour dates. Through all of this, they started to find their sound. John said, quote, The aim of the band on the whole was to hypnotize audiences so that their subconscious would take over. 
It was an attempt to control the unconscious with the hypnotic. In April of 1966, they entered the studio to try and put some of this sound on record. Andy hired Norman Delph, who was a Columbia sales executive and part-time DJ, to be the producer. I think Norman's primary strength was that he was a complete novice and knew to stay out of the way. He said, quote, The musical decisions, I would say, were made in the main by John Cale and Sterling. In terms of the balance or feel-wise, I would give them credit for it, end quote. Andy was there at the recording, but at least according to Lou, kept a really low profile because he knew he just didn't really know much about how to make a good song. Once the album was done, Norman pitched it to his bosses at Columbia, who immediately rejected it. So it ended up with Tom Wilson at Verve Records, who had just gotten done producing Like a Rolling Stone for Bob Dylan. So Tom got them their first record deal at Verve. And maybe that only came about because Andy agreed to design the cover. I mean, you could see right here it says Andy Warhol and like not the Velvet Underground so that was clearly the selling point for Verve. When the album The Velvet Underground and Nico came out in 1967 it was a complete flop. Because of the way that Lou liked to write about the darker side of the underground and had a song named Heroin a lot of record stores and radio stations completely boycotted it. It didn't help that Verve did almost no promotion on it. The failure of that album brought a lot of changes to the band. In May of 1967, Lou finally had enough of Nico. Nico might have thought there was like a power struggle between her and Lou for creative control of the band, but the rest of the band didn't really like Nico either, so that left her kind of isolated fighting against Lou. She had also relaunched her own solo career and started making her own albums and doing her own performances, which made her even more reliable. She was very late to rehearsals and would often miss practices and shows. At a show in Boston, she showed up two hours late, so Lou refused to let her on stage and then kicked her out of the band. But Lou wasn't done there. A few months later, after a little bit of a dispute, he also fired Andy Warhol. John Cale claimed that he had no idea how brutal that firing actually was, and that Lou did it without consulting anyone else in the group. Lou said, quote, Andy sat down and had a talk with me. You gotta decide what you wanna do. Do you wanna keep just playing museums from now on, or do you wanna start moving into other areas? So I thought about it, and I fired him, because I thought that was one of the things to do if we were gonna move away from that world. But whether or not Andy was the one that kinda led Lou there, that firing pretty much severed that relationship. To replace Andy, Lou hired Steve Sesnick. In typical Velvet Underground fashion, that decision brought a lot of drama. Lou and Steve were already pretty good friends, so John felt that by bringing in Steve, it was an attempt to grab more power for Lou and kind of consolidate that into Lou's band and force out John. In January of 1968, they released their second album, White Light, White Heat. It was another commercial failure that faced a lot of the same issues that their debut did. This album was much more aggressively experimental than their debut, and they really tried to push the boundaries of sound as far as they could. But it's worth noting that the recording wasn't the best. They all played in a room together with their amps turned up as high as they would go, so there's just like a ton of sound leakage in it. And again, the failure of that album brought even more tension and more change within the group. John got married, and he thinks that's when him and Lou really separated, even though there was always tension before that. Maybe it was jealousy, especially since John's new wife was much more successful than the Velvet Underground, or maybe John started spending less time with the band and kind of like moved into this new apartment and distanced himself a little bit. Or maybe it was all because Lou wanted to go in a more commercial direction where John wanted to stay in the avant-garde experimental world. This was the same time that Andy Warhol was shot in an attempted assassination, and that really changed Andy's outlook on the downtown art scene that he helped cultivate. It caused Andy to withdraw and move uptown and be a little bit more distanced from the kind of erratic factory scene that he created. And that outlook may have had an impact on Lou, who kind of also wanted to distance himself from that underground scene a little bit. In September of 1968, the Velvet Underground played a show. I've seen some places say that that show was in Boston at the Boston Tea Party. I've seen some places say that it was in California at San Diego's Hippodrome, but pretty much all accounts say that it was one of the very best Velvet Underground shows, that they were firing on all cylinders and were really killing it, which made it even more surprising when Lou called a band meeting. And when Sterling and Moe showed up, John wasn't there, and Lou told them that he fired John. Sterling, in particular, didn't give up on John Cale without a fight. He apparently remembered a lot of pounding on the table, a lot of yelling, trying to convince Lou to reconsider this idea. But Lou gave him an ultimatum. If they wanted to stick with John, then Lou would leave and disband the group. 
So they just kind of had to accept Lou's decision and kick John Cale out of the band. But Lou couldn't do it himself, so he sent Sterling to tell John the news. Lou never talked all that openly about his exact reasons for firing John. He always said that it was for very personal reasons whenever anyone asked him. And at the time, Mo Tucker was like his best friend. She was always there for him to confide in. And she still says to this day, she has no idea the real reasons behind that firing. For his part, John thought that the firing had a lot to do with their drug use. He said that their accelerating drug use fostered an environment of miscommunication and paranoia. So when John started working with Nico on her second studio album and they didn't invite Lou into that process, just created a ton of paranoia in Lou. John said, quote, if all those drugs hadn't been around, we would have all been pushing for something. It was the time to really back off for a minute because the trust was gone, end quote. John also suspected that Steve, their new manager, had a lot to do with the decision. He suggested that Steve encouraged Lou to force John out to consolidate power since he was always much closer to Lou. It's kind of a similar thing that happened with Malcolm McLaren and Johnny Rotten and Glenn Matlock with the Sex Pistols where Malcolm felt like he could control Johnny Rotten more than he could Glenn, so they kind of forced Glenn out, at least that's the alleged story. But in a little more than a year, the Velvet Underground had completely changed. They went from Andy Warhol's multimedia experience pushing the boundaries of what rock music could be, highlighting Nico's unconventional voice and John's droning music to just kind of a relatively straightforward rock band. That change was highlighted when they brought in Doug Ewell. Jenny said when she was just five years old, there was nothing happening at all. Doug was born in Long Island in 1947. He took some lessons on piano as a kid, even though he really wanted to play violin, but all the violins were taken when he went to join the school band. He went to school in Boston, where he soon started playing with a group called Grass Menagerie. By playing with Grass Menagerie, Doug met the Velvet Underground, and he saw them perform in Boston, and he just kind of fell in love with what they were doing. He was just 21 when Lou approached him to join the group, so he must have really looked up to them and seen them as massive inspirations. When the band approached him to join, he went to Lou's loft and played through their entire back catalog in one marathon rehearsal session. The next day, he was on stage with them and an official member of the Velvet Underground. Their third album, called The Velvet Underground and released in March of 1969, is in a lot of ways the polar opposite of their second album. It was far more stripped back, sounding almost intimate, kind of like a singer-songwriter album or hearkening back to that folky demo tape that Lou and John Cale did. It was recorded in LA, so the more laid-back, introspective lyrics fit that California sound more than it fit the New York underground sound. Sterling said, quote, We did the album deliberately as anti-production. It sounds like it was done in the closet. It's flat, and that's the way we wanted it. The songs are all very quiet, and it's kind of insane, end quote. A few months later, the Velvet Underground were booked to play two nights with the Grateful Dead in Chicago. Lou still didn't like them. He said, quote, We had vast objections to the whole San Francisco scene. It's just tedious, a lie, and untalented. They can't play, and they certainly can't write. It's a joke. End quote. For the first night, the Grateful Dead played longer than they were intended to, so when Lou came on stage to kind of, like, tell them to wrap it up, Pigpen shot him a middle finger. So the next night, when it was the Velvet Underground's turn to play first, they retaliated by playing as long as they wanted. They apparently played the song Sister Ray for like over an hour. The Velvet Underground's relationship with their label was starting to stagger, mostly because their albums weren't selling. But Blue already had enough songs written for a fourth LP, so they went into the studio to begin working on that. So eventually they had a few demos, and the label thought that was enough to release like an eight-song, essentially EP, as a prototype for the next record. But then MGM, their label, got into some financial trouble. The executives responded by firing a whole bunch of the staff and cutting like half the bands, including the Velvet Underground. And that really had to hurt Lou's pride. They quickly signed with Atlantic Records, which honestly might have been the label that was more suited for them all along. And then they went back into the studio with the intention of creating a very commercial rock pop album. But Mo had gotten pregnant. And, in her words, she was too fat to reach the drum set, so she couldn't participate in the recording. Doug Yule and his brother took over the drumming, and that drastically changed the sound of this album, because neither of them had the same drumming philosophy that Mo did. The resulting album, called Loaded, released in 1970, was aimed at radio airplay. It was a more upbeat album, they specifically shelved certain songs because they were too sad. 
and the drums that Doug and his brother Billy played on the album were far more straightforward rock, which may have influenced the way that Lou chose to sing. When it came out, Lou was not happy with the final mix of the album, and he didn't appreciate some of the edits that were made in the production process. The Velvet Underground hadn't played a show in New York since 1967, but soon after they started working on Loaded, they settled in for a 10-week residency at Max's Kansas City. The band had never found like massive success, but they still had a really strong, dedicated following of people who appreciated what they were doing and appreciated the experimentation and the new things they were doing. Like, David Bowie heard their debut album and listened to it over and over, and he was just couldn't believe that people could do that with rock music. So these shows at Max's, at kind of like the home base of the factory scene, were still pretty popular. People would come out and just like record the shows, which is why we have a recording of a fateful show on August 23rd, 1970. There was quite a big crowd there that night, including Bridget Berlin. She was something of a recording aficionado, and she had recorded a few of the Velvet Underground sets at Max's Kansas City that summer. So on this night, she had her recorder with her and managed to capture Lou Reed's last ever show with the Velvet Underground. Well, until their reunion, but you know, whatever. Apparently, things came to a head with Lou when he had a massive argument with Steve Sesnick, who told him that he didn't care if Lou lived or died. Since Lou always thought him and Steve were friends, that deeply cut him. Lou also grew tired of their lack of success, and he must have felt like they had kind of done all they could do, and if success hadn't happened yet, it never would for the Velvet Underground. Mo bumped into Lou before the set. She wasn't playing, she was still pregnant, and Lou told her that he was leaving the band. But he didn't tell anyone else until after the set, and Sterling, again, really argued with him, saying that they still had several weeks of shows booked, and they had an album coming out, and this was just bad timing for it, but... Lou had made up his mind, and he wasn't going to be persuaded. The drugs in his veins only cause him to spit. A few weeks later, Loaded was released, and only one person appeared on the back cover, Doug Ewell sitting at a piano. And that really highlighted the fact that the Velvet Underground was now Doug Ewell's band. In 1971, after a show in Houston, Sterling Morrison told the others that he was leaving the band and was going to stay in Texas. According to Lou, quote, Sterling had talked about leaving for so long that it was no surprise when he finally did it, end quote. Sterling wanted to get into academia, something that was always a passion for him, so when he was offered a spot in the English graduate program at the University of Texas, Austin, he decided he was going to take it, and that that was his opportunity to step out of the Velvet Underground. Later that year, after a gig in the Netherlands, Mo Tucker, the last original member, I mean, Besides Angus, I don't know where you start the original member line. Whatever, Mo announced she was leaving the group as well. She went back to Long Island and resumed her job as a key punch operator. And to me, that's kind of the official end of the Velvet Underground. The Doug Yule lineup with the replacements went on to release another album called Squeeze in 1973, which it's not a bad album. Many people love it, but to me, it's just, it's not the Velvet Underground. As I said at the top, I'm not going to get super in-depth into what happened to these members once they left the Velvet Underground. Let me know if there's anyone in particular you would be the most interested in hearing a detailed story of their solo career, but for now, let's just kind of like summarize where their lives went. Nico resumed her solo career, and she worked pretty heavily with John Cale on production and different performances. She also got herself into quite a bit of trouble, and at least according to Danny Fields, had something of a racist streak. In March of 1971, at a restaurant attached to the Chelsea Hotel, she attacked another singer named Emeretta Marks, hitting her in the face with a glass. Allegedly, it was a racially motivated attack, but Nico says she was high on angel dust and doesn't really remember it. Throughout the years, Nico continued to tour, mostly in Europe, and work with John Cale, and she continued to stay pretty heavily addicted to heroin. In 1988, while she was on methadone trying to get off of heroin, her and her son went on a vacation in Ibiza. On that vacation, she fell off her bicycle and hit her head. I think a passing taxi found her and brought her to the hospital, where she was initially misdiagnosed as having heat exhaustion, but she had a cerebral hemorrhage and passed away at the age of 49. John Cale continued to influence and be a staple in the underground experimental music scene, working with incredible groundbreaking artists like Patti Smith. He produced her debut album, Horses. He also released his own solo work and continued to tour. He kind of leaned in to his image as this kind of like rebellious rock star, 
He even decapitated a chicken on stage once. He's still out there playing music, doing his thing, and I think he's sober now. Lou Reed also went on to have a pretty up and down solo career. He released some truly wonderful albums like Berlin, and I'm partial to his album of like Edgar Allan Poe stuff. I think that was really cool. But he also released some albums that were pretty subpar. He got married a couple times and at least on the surface seemed to have a kind of confusing relationship with his own sexuality, but he became something of like an LGBT icon with the way he let sexuality be fluid and move on the spectrum. He battled the press quite often, sometimes being quite mean to them. It kind of became a rite of passage for music journalists to be belittled by Lou Reed, but he maintained that that was all just kind of an act. He put on a persona of Lou Reed to protect him from something. In his later years, he got really into martial arts and Tai Chi and writing, but in 2013, his years of excessive drinking finally caught up to him and he had to have a liver transplant. Later that year, his body started to reject the liver and he passed away at the age of 71. Sterling Morrison tried to continue his career in academia. He was a teacher's assistant for so long at the University of Texas that they wouldn't let him do it anymore and they weren't going to offer him a job as a professor so he left to start working as a tugboat captain. He also played in a few local bands, but like nothing really serious. Sterling was always very health conscious, especially as he got older, but in 1994, right after a brief Velvet Underground reunion that I don't really have the time to talk about, he got super sick. People think that it was the fumes from the tugboats that caused him to be diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. He died one day after his 53rd birthday in 1995. Mo Tucker moved with her husband and her kids to Phoenix, Arizona, but after she got divorced, she moved to Georgia and worked at Walmart for a bit. All the while, she was in different bands and trying to get a solo career off the ground. Lou helped her as much as he could by like producing and promoting her albums, but nothing ever really clicked. She said in an interview in 2010 that she had stopped playing music entirely a few years earlier, and now she spent all of her time caring for her grandson. So that's the Velvet Underground. They're a band that, while they existed, never had any success. At least in terms of the larger music industry, no one paid much attention to them. But they've made a body of work that was as influential as any other band in history. They influenced so many different artists and really pushed the boundaries of what rock music could be and what it could say. They really showed a new side to rock. Ask the Velvet Underground. Let me know what you thought. Drop a comment on anything I left out or anything I mispronounced. I know you're going to do that anyway. Share it with a friend if you liked it and subscribe for more stories from music history.